Butterflies are not only extremely elegant and beautiful light and in communion with the element of air, mm -hmm. they also serve really important roles in the ecosystems that they are a part of. Perhaps most significantly, pollinating important food crops and flowers, that's certainly what we're grateful for them for. Um, but over the last, past four decades, butterfly populations along with so many of our other kin, um, have been decreasing. And many species, including the monarch, have been inching closer to or tipping over into extinction. As with the butterfly, many of our other sacred species and traditions, languages, cultures are going extinct, being lost, maybe being going somewhere to be recombined into new forms of life and culture, perhaps. In these talks, we will hear from people and from groups that are working to re-enliven and reconnect and re-engage through acts of education. And although these projects are going to be shared individually by people who work within them, they're part of this much larger, distributed, loosely networked global movement. So each of the actions we take each time we convene someone for learning, um, or many someones for learning, are those acts are significant and they ripple. They have impacts and effects far beyond. Even this morning, I was thinking about how I could bring some of what I've learned already in the first couple of hours into the spaces I hold and convene. So we're organizing these butterfly talks to connect and share and inspire and spread these butterflies effects when they flap their wings wider for the sake of revitalizing our human and non-human ecosystems. And on this panel, which is called Strengthening Our Roots, Education That Serves Our Ecologies, we get to hear from Rakesh Rootsman Rack, who's with Roots in Permaculture, and Mercia Silva Eichmann, from the Chestnut Tree Ecological School, and Nissa Coit, who's my colleague at EcoGather, talking about our eco-gatherings, and Don Hall, who will talk about my educational journey, seven lessons from an environmental leader. Um, the format will be about 10 or so minutes from each person to be able to present their project and their vision. Uh, and then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A at the end. Each panelist will go to a breakout room and the audience will be able to choose to go to whichever breakout room they want to go to based on which talk piqued their interest and most aligned with their work. So with that, I'm going to um, invite Rakesh to come forward and let me just grab, oh, Got did I see, one. there we go, <laughs> there we go. Did I see that the bios wound go, up? Rakesh, go, Rakesh, <laughs> go. There are the bios. <laughs> I'm going to avoid reading out the bios as a way to reclaim a little bit of the time for everyone's presentation <laughs> since we're a bit behind. Um, but Rakesh, welcome, and um, we're Your really here. Okay, thank you. So I've got a room full of people. I'm, I'm itinerant so I travel a lot and I've just arrived in uh, Vienna and another group of really 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 lovely friends from Finland <laughs> who are also traveling around we just happen to kind of meet here and they've just just kind of arrived so it's a little bit chaotic but it's all good <laughs> that's all cool so yes yeah, so I'm um yeah my name is Rakesh Rootsman Rak is actually my DJ name uh so uh, so I kind of present myself really as first and foremost, I'm a DJ, I'm a reggae DJ who in part, my part time, I kind of teach permaculture, I teach people how to grow food, how to, you know, how to live in an environmentally friendly way. And, um, and I guess I've been teaching ever since I can remember, uh, even at school, which I didn't agree with at all. Um, in terms of, I, I just really didn't get on with school and the school style. And what they were trying to teach me, I really felt that they were brainwashing me into 
believing in a world that I could see was very different. So even there, you know, even though I failed almost every mm. single exam, I, yeah, my, my school friend said whenever they had a problem, whenever they needed to learn something about life, they would always come to me. So I've been teaching ever since I can remember. In fact, my name, Rakesh, means Lord of the Full Moon, which um, I only found out quite recently means uh, as a, uh, the moon doesn't have any energy or light of itself. But as a guide, as a teacher, through its presence, it reflects the sun's uh, energy, the sun's light, and therefore through its presence, it guides. So Rakesh is someone who teaches through his presence. So, yeah, so the idea of, of today, I was invited to ask, uh, to talk about a little bit about my uh, way of teaching. And, um, and I guess, you know, coming from a background where I really shunned education, um, uh, I, you know, I, I really couldn't, um, I really couldn't follow the, the style of education that, that was kind of presented to me. I didn't agree with a lot of what they were saying. So my style of education is really uh, formulated by my experience of how I really don't want to be brainwashed. And, um, and so, yeah, so I guess if we're looking at how to um, reimagine education, I guess the place where we may, might need to start is really looking at, well, why? What is education about? What is its purpose? And so, as far as I'm concerned, oh, sorry, just one second. Edgy, do you mind maybe talking outside? Sorry. sorry, I'm just getting distracted by my, my friends here. Um, so yeah, so if we're really looking at the, yeah, what is the purpose, first of all, of education? Um, so it's how is it that we get people to meet their needs? Uh, how is it they navigate the world, you know, meet their needs in a way that also takes care of other people, in a way that takes care of the planet, takes care of animals and insects and birds. And, you know, how is it that, that we can navigate living in this most amazing, beautiful world that we live in? Uh, with respect for each other, for our surroundings, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, yeah, so education for me is about uh, giving people not just the tools, but the experience of really living in a way that is respectful to each other and our surroundings. Uh, let's say how you meet your needs in a really beautiful, creative way. So I guess the next area we can look at is, well, who? Um, you know, we're looking at anyone, everyone is, you know, I think a really good friend of mine, uh, he would always say that uh, the time when you stop learning, the, the symptom of, of not learning is basically death, you know, so the only time that you stop learning is when you leave this planet. And, um, and so, you know, so our scope for who to educate is pretty much anyone and everyone. And but in particular, we really need to be, uh, uh, you know, guiding the, the younger people so that they, they, you know, uh, as we can see right now, we see so much eco anxiety and what have you, and we need to be able to give them the strength and the, the, the knowledge that whatever it is that they do, if they behave in a particular way, if they see the world in a particular way, then they will be part of the solution. You know, I really love this idea of um, Joanna Macy, you know, where she talks about how, you know, future generations will look back at us and uh, they could say one of two things. Either, you know, you knew, you, you, you knew what was going to happen. You could see, we, could, we, we looked at all the newspaper cuttings and uh, all the reports. You knew that if you carried on working this way, the world would end up in this disaster. And yet you did nothing. You stood by and you watched. Or you could look back and, you know, and, and the future generations look back and say, wow, in spite of all the government pressure, the corporations that were trying to stop you, in spite of all the, you know, the nonsense that was going on, you stood up and you did something about it. Wow. Thank you so much. What inspired you? What gave you that strength? So for me, this is what education is. It's about giving people the, the tools that they need and the experience to actually go about 
uh, bringing about that beautiful change that we all dream of and we all know is possible. So because we're pretty much teaching anyone and everyone, the, the, the next important thing we need to think about is how do we really make these courses, this education really accessible? And I mean accessible to, um, you know, whether it's people who are disenfranchised, marginalised, you know, people of, uh, of different backgrounds, different, you know, um, yeah, you know, different age groups, you know, so how is it, for example, if you look on my courses, I'm really blessed because of how I package my courses, is I have people from all over the world. I have a lot of people who are from, you know, different marginalised communities, a lot of people of colour. I have a, a, a really significant number of people from the LGBTQ community. I have people who are, you know, young, old. I have, and, you know, they all gravitate towards my workshop because of how I package it, because of how I have a history of creating really safe spaces for people to come and be themselves. I've had people, um, you know, come to me and say, I've waited five years for a permaculture course uh, because I've been waiting for a non-white male to come and teach permaculture. And finally, thankfully, because at least now you can understand where I'm coming from. You can understand my perspective as opposed to, you know, preaching a kind of, you know, um, you know, more colonialism, basically. You know, and we, we see in, in the permaculture world how... Um, even though the history of permaculture is really clear in terms of where it came from, uh, you know, and it was really respectful to all the different, uh, you know, cultures who, you know, who helped to formulate the, the kind of ideas and concepts that permaculture now packages. But many of the teachers don't recognize that and see that. So they're packaging it in a really colonialist way. Why are you doing it that way? You should be doing it like this. Having, you know, taken a particular culture's ideas and strategies that, you know, that colonialists came and said, why are you doing it like that? Do it our way, you know, at the end of a the gun. Then all of a sudden, more white colonialists are coming and saying, no, don't do it like that, do it this way, permaculture. And so it's the same pattern. So many people, because of my diversity, feel that they can come to my course. And this is another part is really deeply looking at the colonialization or decolonializing culture and transition town and many of the other green movements um so yeah and the other thing that you'll see quite often in many of my workshops are many people you know mothers parents who come to my workshop because the way i see it is to say uh that just because you're a mother that all of a sudden you can't come to my workshop because we're not going to look after you and your kid is going to be too much of a distraction what nonsense is that you know, children are part of our community. They're part of our life. How is it that we as a community can't take care of the children and the parents during our course and learn together? And and you'll see and we see at the end of it, you know, uh, it, it's really beautiful to see how the, the child, maybe you know, the parent says, wow, this child for years, you know, doesn't go up to anyone. But now after two weeks, they are rushing into arms of other people. You know, and the child they can see grows because of the environment that we create. So, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so how is it we make, you know, whether it's cost, uh, how, do, you know, how do we make these accessible to different people? How do we make it attractive to different people from different backgrounds to be part? And what we see very often is people from the marginalized communities, because of being marginalized, probably have a lot more to say, a lot more experience, a lot more in resonance with permaculture and actually doing a lot of permaculture already. Uh, and so they actually have a lot more to contribute to the course than, um, you know, than, than, than many other people who have a more, you know, um, like a, maybe a white male kind of, you know, who had a certain level of privilege in their life. So, um, yeah, so how do we, yeah, how do we make it accessible? How do we make sure that we've got the right people there? And then how is it that we, I, I think another important part with my style of teaching is I don't actually teach. What I do is I facilitate learning. So I'm there, not as the person who has all the knowledge about everything, but someone, you know, so if someone else on my course 
knows more about a subject than I do, I would be really foolish to try and pretend I know more than that person and to shut them down. That is, for me, that is absolute stupidity. It's like, wow, you know about what? Oh, amazing, great. Oh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be, and really allow each other to teach each other. So again, my style of teaching is more about painting ideas, painting pictures, giving a few facts, and then getting people to work it out for themselves. And, you know, painting scenarios, giving, you know, using their imagination to think in this scenario, what do you think might happen here? Because what we see quite often in, in conventional uh, education is we're told lots of facts, we're told lots of, uh, you know, um, of things that are irrefutable. This is the way it is. Learn it, figure it, you know, just learn it. Whereas my style is, um, is more about, no, let's, let's work this out ourselves. Let's try and see all the variations and see, right, here's a pattern, here's a principle. Uh, let's apply it to this scenario, like food growing, to building a house, to making energy, electricity, to heating, to cooling, to, you know, fermenting, preserving foods, to whatever area we want to bring it to, also for your own personal health and well-being. So how is it we apply all of this to uh, to the different areas? And, um, and yeah, and really getting people through their own imagination to work it out so that they can then see, right, in this particular instance, in this particular place, this is how we actually implement it. Whereas over there, where we've got different circumstances, we need to uh, do it that way because of these different circumstances. So rather than having a recipe, you know, teach people how to really think. Um, so yeah, so this is my style. And it's about how do we go from that kind of theory to think, to work things out, to see the repercussions of our actions, to think it through, and then try it. Have a go, make mistakes, really important. So when I teach, for example, how to make uh, cook stoves, I, I say, right, these are the principles, this is what we want to do, you know, maybe we want to make a biochar cook stove. So these are the principles, this is the energy, it needs to go from here to there to there. To there. This is what we want to achieve. Here's a bunch of materials, how are you going to make it? And what I look at is I watch, all I need to make sure is whatever they're doing uh, is not dangerous. And when they do it, that if, and in certain things I can see, this is not going to work. But I can see that it's easily fixable later on. So I allow them to make those mistakes. I allow them to make those mistakes and then, hmm, why do you think that didn't work? Ah, what if we made this hole a little bit bigger here, allowed a bit more of that energy to go from there to there. And then they try it, they fix it, and then all of a sudden it works. And now, for me, this is real learning. This is real education. So, again, we're, we're because of the paradigm we're living in, quite often people are um, afraid to make mistakes because we're told once you've been told something, you must know it. And that is so unrealistic, you know. Um, and so... Yes, yeah, so so quite often people are afraid to try things, and that fear, that lethargy, really uh, stops people from actually making, you know, making a difference and really putting things into practice. So, so yes, yeah, so what I encourage people to do is really to make those mistakes, but make safe mistakes. Don't make mistakes that are going to be irrecoverable. And so that that's my role. That's my role is just to facilitate this kind of creativity, this iterative kind of approach. Try something, fail, try it again, fail, try it again. Ah, amazing. Now I learn. Now I know what to do. So as you can probably tell, I can probably talk for hours and hours and hours. I'm not sure how much more time I have. Uh, we're about, minutes, uh, I think we're about there for right now. Okay. Um, okay. But what a beautiful place to to sort of transition on kind of the failing forward the dancing with with failure and the making mistakes is such a such a key difference in in your way of approaching education and it feels so beautiful and so welcome among all of what you just shared but can um, i add one one very last thing please. which is that okay so you've got the course itself which is one thing and people navigate through that and you say you create a really beautiful safe space where we make our own rules our own culture of how is it that we, uh, you know, so, so how I set it up is I set it up in a way that I say, right, my role is to facilitate learning, whereas your role as students is to make this the most beautiful, most wonderful, most uh, learnful space. I'm not sure if that's a real word, but I use it anyway. 
is the most learnful space where you really feel comfortable to help each other to learn. And so that means you work out how we're going to cook, how we're going to clean, how we're going to sleep, how that's your responsibility. So people take responsibility for, yeah, for that. And part of that is your responsibility is to create the culture for how we navigate these two weeks or however long we're there for. So, so yeah, so creating that really beautiful safe space. And then the last thing is uh, once the course is finished, you know, that's actually where the education actually now begins, because now you need to put this into action in your real life. So what's really important for me is to then give the students a, a space, a place where they can communicate. So once a month, we have a Roots and Permaculture Learning Day, where it's three hours, people can come open space style, whatever they want to talk about, whatever they want to discuss, you know, like, um, if they just started to make a grey water treatment system, okay, come and you need some help with it come explain it you know or maybe quite often people go and learn something and they come oh my god i need to tell you this this is amazing ah oh, and they feel really excited to share with other people and and so yes yeah, so to allow people that space where after the course they have an opportunity to continue learning so these this is my uh this is how i yeah um, i i run my workshops and as uh, say that the, the most important thing is really how to make it accessible. So for many people, you know, on the same course, someone may have paid paid fifty pounds, someone else may have paid five hundred pounds for the same workshop, because five pounds for one person may be a huge amount of money, five thousand pounds may be nothing to someone else. So for me to set a fixed price uh, doesn't make any sense. It's about getting this to the people who really need it, who really appreciate it. So yes, that diversity and that accessibility is, is safe is key. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yes, exploring exploring ways of addressing the financial accessibility piece, I think, was a big part of the conversation I facilitated at the last rec, which is such an important thing in all of our work to figure out how to um, keep this hyper significant collective fiction of money. Um, from being a barrier into these spaces. So thank you for adding that. I didn't get to meet everyone beforehand because we didn't have those 10 minutes. So I'm going to keep doing my best to pronounce everyone's names the way I'm reading them. And then you'll all just correct, correct me. Uh, Mercia? That's correct. Okay, good. <laughs> Mercia Silva is up next. I'll let wow. you just get in. Can everybody hear me? Give me a stretch. And me some love, Rakesh. I fully felt that what you said. Thank you for sharing that true educator, and I feel it here. Um, I have a little PowerPoint for everybody because I would like to share with you in a more graphic way what we've been doing. You should be able to share fine. Yeah, can I now? Um let me just wait for the permission. No, not yet. I got this. No, it doesn't go yet. Maura, I don't have the ability to make her a co-host or offer. No, I don't either. So um, give me a second, please. I'm Okay. Thought I, had, I thought I was able to give it to you right away, but it's giving me a problem. A little bit more complicated. So I share a little bit. I'm I'm from Brazil, and uh, if you live outside Europe or outside the United States, uh, life is a little bit slower when we want to seek opportunities, and that is my journey. Uh, there is a lot of. Um, fighting for opportunities and trying my best to get there. So I would say it takes us longer to find out what are our role in this world because our process of learning is different. So I am from Belo Horizonte and through the YMCA, I got several opportunities to get involved in the environmental programs, both in, in Brazil, then in the U.S., and then in other places. 
I end up studying Switzerland, not because it's fancy and amazing, but I figured out that studying Switzerland was cheaper than studying Brazil. And then that was a door that opened me a lot of new opportunities. So after 15 years in Switzerland, studying geography, being a dendrochronologist, my husband and I, we, we came to the sun in Barcelona in Catalonia. And the pandemic started right away when we, we arrived. And as educators, as people who love nature, we realized that the situation for students in Catalonia was very difficult. Uh, the ratio, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Uh, the ratio of students is quite, um, let me see, I'm trying. Is that my presentation? You have my presentation, right? Yes, you can share your own now. I think um, Andrea I'm sharing it my screen. Oh, okay. Are you sharing your screen? Then, Thanks, yes, Dan. if you want, we can go with Dan and his screen. I sent the presentation already. That's that's helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, so we adapted here and we had a true lockdown. We couldn't leave home. The kids that when they came back to school, it was very challenging. And by chance, we were invited to visit a family that had three kids and were looking for a, a, a teacher that could teach them at home. So do you think I could move from here or then you pass it for me? So this is the first time we got, this is me and my husband and we got to this place that was first abandoned for 25 years. And we went there to teach three kids and you know, the universe prepares a special places. And when we arrived there, I said, that's a place that we could start a school. Having nature alternatives for kids would be beautiful. Next this slide. So this place is 35 minutes from Barcelona. We're on the countryside and it's seven hectares of beautiful Mediterranean land that we decided to start the school uh, for a school base, but with a curriculum. You can continue. What type of pedagogy we decided to use? Well, I studied in Catholic school. So I honestly question what education has been all these years with all the meanings behind that. But Paulo Freire from Brazil, from the critical and social pedagogy, during the Rio 92, he started writing about eco-pedagogy, but he wasn't able to finish that. And that is simply the concept of learning about yourself, learning how to relate with others, learning how to take care of nature. And he didn't finish that, but other researchers continue his work. Next. Um, Starting a school felt like a dream. We had the power, the emotional power to do that. But soon enough, we found out that alternative schooling in Spain has always been an anarchic movement. And since the 19, uh, 19th century, for example, Francisco Ferreri Guardia, he started one of the first modern schools in Barcelona just to be killed persecuted. He was persecuted and killed in 1909 for starting a school that was outside the models expected. So with the whole civil war and then the, the, the dictatorship, it was very difficult to install any type of uh, schooling. In the present, the, bureaucrat the, the, the bureaucratic system still remains. Schools like ours cannot be recognized. There is no single law that can uh, affirm that we are a school in a forest. Uh, next. But interesting cases happen too. Um, Marti Boada Junca is a geographer. And after the dictatorship, he started the first ecological school in, in Europe. And he was granted by Nelson Mandela Prize for his work. And with our progress at the school, we, we were at one moment denounced to the government that we were an illegal school. And Marty became our friend 
And so these photos you see is from him in 1978 with kids in the forest. And this photo is from two weeks ago uh, at our place at the school. And he has been a shield of power through what we've been doing so far. Next. So our vision is to create this space where we grow with the space. We, we, we live in a, in a peaceful uh, and connected heart with nature and with the people around us. Next. So everything is everything we do, we do for the community. We are 17 nationalities. We have three full-time teachers. We offer tuitions that are accessible for anybody coming. Uh, we offer scholarships. We currently have 32 students. Next. Gaia came as a beautiful support with the ecological curriculum and UNESCO and curriculum from the European Union. So we merge, we can go to the next one. We merge our curriculum with soft skills. So they do learn mathematics and science, but they also learn Kaizen, diplomacy, chess, capoeira, qigong, yoga, gardening, cooking, forest ecology, tree health. So that's the way we go. Next. We have a lot of space to share knowledge, not only from a scientific point of view. We share what we know. We share our stories. We share our past. Next. And we welcome everyone to tell their story. Uh, this week, we had a very beautiful story to tell from one of the indigenous tribes from Amazon in, in Brazil. And what touched my heart mostly was to hear from the shaman. He said, oh, your kids are just like ours in the tribe. And I was like, how? And he said, they are free. They are wise. Please don't let them to lose their wisdom. And that was such a certification for me that we're putting the right effort. Next. You probably cannot hear the sound, but this is a friend of us that introduced us to the project. With other families from all different cultures and backgrounds, it gives them this expanded sense of what home is, what earth is. And also you can feel there's an open psychology versus when it's only one culture, there's a, there's a smallness that happens. And if our children are going to face um, the continued degradation of planetary systems, the growth of um, economic strife and warfare. I think that, you know, having an uh, international uh, expanded understanding of, of their place in the world is going to give my boys a, an amazing capacity to contend and to be agents of change. I love it. And for you as an adult, because one of the things that I love about the school is that um, the parents seem, most of the parents seem to be intimately involved on, on different levels and yeah. some teach there, but but it's not just the kids that benefit. Yeah. It seems to be almost a requirement yeah. to be inclusive. Yeah, I mean, one thing I love about the school and one of the reasons we said a strong yes to the school is because the parents are invited to participate in the curriculum of the kids, which um, is very different than the strong schism that's created between family and children because of the economic systems that we're living in. We're all enslaved to our jobs or maybe not enslaved, but we're, we're part where we got to work. We got to make the, make the money. And so just as a result, there's not even a question, are the, could the parents participate more in the education, right? This isn't just about parent-teacher meetings. This is about, you know, us as parents being able to co-create the curriculum in different ways. You know, we were able to bring in our friend who's an expert in nutrition to lead a course in nutrition. Yes, then this is complementary to the talk. Look, we offer a lot of things and we have some needs that we would like to leave it over there. And we are so happy to collaborate in any levels. Um, so I will leave this list afterwards for everybody. Next. Uh and uh, get in touch. I believe that this type of con 
of education, of type of humanized education, especially, is important to be shared. And we are for sure stronger together. So oh, wow. let's connect. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Marcia. That is just so beautiful. And I'm so glad you put some of those video clips in there so that we could get a real sense of this beautiful, deeply place embedded and intergenerational kind of relational education you're offering. Thank you so much. Mm. All right, Nissa. I think you're up next and I'm going to try to keep moving us at a clip. I'll take care of dropping some links for you as you talk because I know quite a bit about what what you're talking about. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, yeah, so Nicole and I work together at EcoGather and Nicole has taught uh, or has spoken about what we've done in the past couple of um, reimagining education conferences. Um, but what we've been doing lately has evolved a lot from where we began. So EcoGather kind of began with the premise of creating, co-creating with communities in different places, a series of courses on a variety of topics from like agroecology and economics, well-being economics and chain shaping and all these things, but they were all kind of flat and lonely and you might even say boring because they were asynchronous um, online courses and we didn't really know what to do with them um, and there wasn't like you know selling courses didn't really feel like what we were trying to do but it was sort of like the framework that the project was originally formulated around um, but there was a lot of really awesome material and content and ideas in these courses and we wanted to figure out how we might um, sort of bring them to life a little bit more. Um, and one of the courses that is in that group that has managed to be a lot more lively and create create more community has been um, Sean Chamberlain's Surviving the Future course, which he's spoken a lot about um, in this conference as well in, in past years. And we just kind of found that that course had a lot more, like I said, livelihood and or they were, it was just more lively and and creative and interesting and then people were more engaged. Um, and probably because it had more of like a cohorted um, community live session aspect to it than just having like something you click through on your own. Um, at some point, like we heard some statistic that like 90% of online courses are never finished. So um, having people to travel with it through is, is really helpful. Um, and so, but in the course of creating these courses, the team, our team, our internal team, we're learning so much from each other and from the people that we were co-creating these courses with. And we found so much personal growth in just talking to each other across our different experiences and expertise and interests. And we wanted to sort of recreate that experience. So my coworker and I, who has since moved on, um, to other things. We would spend hours in our office that we shared just like trying to explain these different concepts to each other. She was a social scientist, I was more of a natural scientist, and we would just like find all these awesome places where our expertise or our experiences and our understanding of the world overlapped. Um, and we had so much fun, even though neither of us were like really experts in any of the things that we were talking about. We were just able to explain it to each other and it was we were just like having these breakthroughs. And so we decided we wanted to figure out how to recreate that for other people on Zoom and and have like a, a global network of these conversations that were, you know, dealing with these existential problems that we're facing and creating these paradigm shifts. So a little over a year ago, we started sort of experimenting with what we've been calling eco gatherings. Um, and the original formulation, I guess, was we wanted it to feel like we were in that office where there was string lights and we, we had tea and we were cozy on the couch um, and it would just feel sort of like mingling at like a party with the, all of the best people and having really deep conversations about different things. So we started hosting weekly gatherings on Zoom where there would be a few resources that people might be able to read in advance or listen to. And then we would sort of convene around a particular topic. 
Um, and then we could just sort of like get right to the meat of, of the thing since people would sort of be caught up. Um, and so format that we've established so far has been one that we've stuck with for the most part, which is when we get into these hour and a half sessions, um, there's a newsletter that goes out in advance that gets people sort of primed for what we're going to be talking about. And we start with trying to like ground into the space. Um, well, before that, we actually have music playing and there's something pretty on the screen so people can sort of feel like they can trickle into like a party. Um, and people are kind of chit chatting and small talk before we like really get started. And we tried to create the sense that we're like really in this space by grounding in and having like a, a, a grounding where we listen together or breathe together, go through something like that at first. Um, and then we have like a short framing for the people that didn't have time to read the newsletter or the, or the resources because we want to keep it accessible to folks so that, you know, if you just drop in, that's also totally fine. Uh, so we kind of get people caught up to speed briefly. And then we go out to our different breakout rooms so that people get a chance to talk more one-on-one -on -one or a little in smaller groups with each other and then come back together and sort of swap ideas and then meet with new people. And we get to really like, like grow into these topics. And the one thing that we found in the course of, um, you know, I think it was maybe almost a year, six months, eight months that we've been doing them that an hour and a half really wasn't enough time to really get to the meat of what we wanted to talk about. We always felt sort of like we've been zoomed out of these rooms too quickly or that we just, we just like wet our appetites for these topics. So lately in an effort to both spend more time on certain topics, and also to feel more in line with like we want to decolonize decolonize our relationship with time and also to feel like the natural rhythms of the world are actually dictating our lives a little bit more you know of course they are but we sometimes don't feel that way we've been trying to um spend a lunar cycle on on one topic so each week we'll meet and we sort of line them up roughly with the, 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 you know, the new moon, we start a new topic, and then we go to a different angle of that topic. And then at the full moon, we can finally, like, really dig into one piece, one of these resources, because we'd often found that one of the readings that we assigned was really awesome, but nobody had time to read it, and we never really got a chance to talk about it. So on the full moon, you really focus. And then we also tried to spend um, one of the sessions, like, putting what we've been talking about into practice, because oftentimes we would talk about something and people would be like so inspired and, and buzzing and like, oh, now what? And then we would kind of just trail off. So now we're trying to be like, you know what, what do we do about it? What, what can we sort of create together and feel a little bit more like we have like agency and um, action involved in, in the talking as well. Um, and yeah, so over the course of this year of doing these, it's been really awesome to see like, the connections people have made. There's been sessions where people end up crying or laughing and and like real friendships are forming across um, geography, across different generations. Um, in fact, it's always my favorite thing when people that meet on an eco gathering end up like, oh, you live in my city too. And then they like go and actually be friends in real life, which is such an awesome thing to see uh, happening. Um, and then the other thing that we like to do is we create the the newsletter in advance that explains everything. We compile all these resources and we send out an original piece of writing about the topic. And then we post all those resources online, which is the 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 point of which is to both allow people to revisit them and dive deeper when they want to, and even maybe take one of those boring asynchronous classes if they're really, really inspired. Um, but our dream sort of is to have people have a really awesome conversation online and then take those resources and use what we've already sort of packaged to host these kinds of conversations in their own place at their local library or a community center or something um, and just kind of spread the, the mycelial web. So, yeah. Thank you, Nissa. Yeah, and another thing that we're doing um, that's not done yet is we're actually breaking apart all of those courses, which were co-created with community organizations, not unlike the ones that Rakesh or Mercia just talked about. Um, 
and so they're they're infused with the spirit of those groups but they're they're broken into kind of silos on this topic and this topic so we're currently transplanting all of those resources into a more accessible digital garden as well it's not done yet it's actually like part of why i'm not upstairs in my office because nissa and i broke it apart and made it look crazy <laughs> but uh as we try to map it out but a big part of our theory of change is certainly to be able to help resource other groups and organizations around the world um, doing this kind of education in their own places. So um, take a look and, and see if we can be in collaboration in some way. All right, Dan, I want to, oops, oops, where am I? Don, we're up to Don next, and I want to give you as much space as we can. All right. Yeah, I'll be pretty quick. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, great to see you. Thanks for those excellent presentations. Uh, I'm going to share my screen if I can. Uh, it looks like I can. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Don Hall. I'm uh, the author of the Regeneration Handbook, uh, which just came out in June from New Society Publishers. Uh, really proud of it. And um, I decided to title my presentation, My Educational Journey, uh, Seven Lessons from an Environmental Leader, because I think um, one of the most important things that education can do right now is to create more environmental leaders. Uh, so I don't think my uh, presentation offers a definitive answer uh, to how environmental leaders are made, uh, but Hopefully it uh, presents at least a few clues. Uh, so I'm going to tell my story uh, using the framework of Theory U, uh, which has been developed by MIT Professor Otto Scharmer, because I think it's a great description of a uh, pattern of transformation. And I think that uh, becoming an environmental leader, at least for me, uh, really has been a process of deep transformation. Uh, so the Theory U process uh, begins with downloading, uh, which is essentially the act of uh, just repeating the patterns of the past uh, and applying them to new situations kind of indiscriminately, just doing what we've always done before. Uh, for me, downloading looked a little bit like this. Uh, this is the house that I actually grew up in, in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Uh, in many ways, I had a very privileged upbringing, uh, including uh, being able to go to what were considered some of the best public schools in the U.S. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, I really did not connect with my educational experience growing up. Um, you know, it seemed just to be a lot of uh, memorization without any connection to the real world or what this knowledge was uh, meant to help me to do. Uh, and so it just contributed to my feeling that this kind of idyllic representation of the American dream was... Uh, false and empty. Um, and in my search for something real uh, in high school, you know, I turned to partying, sneaking out, meeting girls, smoking, drinking, experimenting with drugs, all that uh, good stuff. I like to say I was a, a rebel without a clue. So lesson number one, uh, we all know this, the edu current educational system is broken if it can't work for somebody uh, who has all the advantages like myself. Uh, it's not working really for anybody. So Theory U teaches us we need to move from downloading to actually seeing, uh, to uh, getting out in the world, having new experiences. Um, uh, really broadening our horizons and taking in new information. Um, so this really uh, started happening for me when I went on an outward bound course uh, when I was 16 years old. Uh, my parents were definitely not outdoorsy people. I think my mother camped out once when she was a teenager and uh, got bit by mosquitoes and decided she'd uh, never spend much time outside again. Uh, so just being in nature for three weeks solid 
uh, was a hugely revelatory experience for me. Um, I know this is true of a lot of other environmental leaders that, you know, the root of their care and their inspiration uh, came from nature itself and really started to feel a huge amount of confidence, uh, starting to understand who I really was and opening up uh, in a big way. I uh, Shortly after this course, I did a kind of 180. I was repairing my relationship with my parents. I started getting interested in school again, um, interested in art and poetry, uh, became a vegetarian, uh, and got an award for most improved student that year. Uh, so moving from seeing to sensing is kind of making sense of all this new information that taking in and uh, what does it really mean uh, for me? What does it uh, mean for my understanding of the world? Um, so I went to college at New York University, a uh, very fancy, very expensive school, but uh, my best education uh, really came from getting involved in activism. I wanted to find some kind of way to give back uh, for all I had received. Uh, so I got involved first with the Students for Free Tibet, uh, then with the anti-war and anti-globalization movements of the early 2000s, um, and uh, eventually uh, with a local uh, climate action network. Uh, and this was uh, hugely eye-opening, great to experience lots of different approaches to change making and learning so much about the world uh, at the same time. So uh, really don't think you have to go to a, a fancy college like I did to, to get that. Uh, presencing is really about moving into a space of deep reflection about, you know, what is my calling? What is my purpose? in the world, um, you know, where, what is mine to do? Um, and I had become a little bit disenchanted with what I call conventional political activism, the kind of oppositionality of it, uh, the kind of anger and uh, uh, guilt and, um, yeah, the uh, not getting to root causes, not providing a kind of positive alternative, but I didn't know where to look for something else. That's all I knew. That's all I had been exposed to. Uh, but I had thought about uh, dropping out of NYU uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate and didn't have the courage to do that. Uh, I had thought about dropping out and going to Naropa University here in Boulder, Colorado, where I'm speaking to you from today. And I think I felt like, well, you know, a degree from Naropa, uh, this Buddhist inspired college, uh, what, would, what kind of job would that actually get me? Um, you know, where would I just be throwing money away? And, uh, but by the time I had gotten to this point, I was ready to uh, take a little bit of a leap of faith. And I decided to uh, enroll in the master's program in environmental leadership at Naropa. And uh, it turned out to be an amazing fit for my interests, kind of joining uh, activism with spirituality and um, gave me the confidence uh, that I needed to lead and um, yeah, really set me on the path I've been on ever since. So crystallizing is about taking that kind of sense of calling, uh, that vision that emerges in presencing and starting to really develop it into something more tangible. Um, one part of my Naropa program uh, was instead of a thesis, we had an applied leadership project and we had to work with a local organization in the community. So I chose to work with uh, organization called Boulder County Going Local that then became the first uh, official initiative of the International Transition Towns Movement in North America. Uh, we became Transition Boulder County and then Transition Colorado 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Transition is a movement that came out of permaculture. Uh, it started in 2005 in the UK, uh, really trying to apply permaculture skills, solutions uh, to whole communities. You know, how can we create more just and regenerative communities? And um, yeah, this was a really formative experience for me. Uh, I started working for Transition Colorado uh, while I was finishing up my master's degree and then uh, went full time with them after I graduated. And uh, I learned a lot from my uh, mentors, Michael Brownlee and Lynette Marie Hanthorne, uh, both, you know, what uh, what to do, but also uh, what not to do <laughs> and started to kind of form my own vision about how to uh, do this kind of uh, really revolutionary bottom-up transition work. Uh, but I started to realize that if I was going to help other people to do this work, uh, which was kind of the role I found myself in in Transition Colorado, I needed to experience it myself. I needed to build a local transition initiative from the ground up. Uh, because, you know, you can have all the best theory in the world and you can uh, lead people badly astray uh, if you're not connected to the actual experience. So I moved back to my sometimes hometown of Sarasota, Florida and started uh, Transition Sarasota. And uh, we did lots of different things, lots of educational programs and community dialogues. Uh, lots of practical projects, particularly around local food. This is a picture of uh, our Suncoast Gleaning Project, which continues to run to this day, uh, harvesting surplus produce from local farms, uh, anything that's not going to make it to market next week, and um, donating that to local food banks to benefit the food insecure in our community. Uh, now have donated over half a million pounds of local produce uh, have really influenced our local food bank uh, to invest in that, uh, to invest in uh, bringing fresh produce to those who need it most, uh, and doing a lot of other projects as well. We started uh, Eat Local Week, uh, Eat Local Resource Guide and Directory, uh, helped to direct some investment uh, money to local food businesses, startups and expansions, uh, and so forth and learned so much uh, from this experience. Not always easy, but uh, uh, definitely uh, growth provoking. Uh, and this experience enabled me to move into a role where I could kind of authentically teach and help and support others uh, to do this kind of work on the ground in their local communities. Uh, so in 2017, I started working with uh, the National Transition Organization, Transition US, uh, currently work with the International Transition Network uh, as training coordinator, uh, helping to coordinate a community of about 70 uh, transition trainers uh, around the world, I think about 25 different countries, uh, and wrote this regenerative uh, regeneration handbook uh, in the last couple of years, and uh, I couldn't have done this without going on this this whole journey. Um, and we all know the uh, um, the phrase or uh, whatever: uh, those who those who can't teach, uh, which I think is very insulting to teachers. Um, and I and I also think that it, it, we should reverse that to say that those who can should teach because their knowledge is really grounded in experience uh, and can be relied on um, much more than those who only have a bunch of good theory uh, from their schooling. So that's such uh, a that's there. such a wonderful insight, right? Those who can should teach as opposed to that tired formulation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how cool to watch you map your journey onto Otto's theory, you uh, principles and, and trajectory there. That was a really cool 
way of thinking about moving through your life that uh, had some similarities to mine. You'll catch up and see that in the chat. <laughs> um, all right, we're at 106. I both want to respect time and also to respect space. And so how to think about doing that right now. Um, Maura has informed me that nobody is using the room for a little bit longer. And yet, I also want people to be able to have a pause to refresh if they um, if they feel they need to before they move into their next session. And so with me, like kind of looking Dan in the eyes here to just quick check in on, on process and protocol, I think I'm going to let us take just a moment to thank our speakers for their stories and for their really good work in the world. Um, and if you need to step out at this point, this is a great time to hit the red button for yourself and go take that break. And then we'll see if there are folks who'd like to stick around and ask a few questions, um, connect with one of the speakers or follow up in any way. Um, so I'm just going to allow us to gently exit to celebrate and offer gratitude and then um, see who is here and what we want to do. Does that sound okay, Dan? Okay. okay. Watching the squares reorganize themselves a little bit. Um, let me try this. Folks who are here in attendance, uh, is there someone you'd like to speak to? In a, would you like to go into a breakout room and get to speak to someone or would you like to just toss a question out question or two out here. Maybe if you have a question, you can put your hand up and I can see how many folks there are. The raise hand button should be at the bottom of your screen under reactions. So Molly, come on off mute. Hey, um, I really enjoyed listening to everybody. It's really inspiring to see what people are doing in the world. Um, all the good people. Um, my question was specifically to Marcia. Um, uh, you said something about um, how one of uh, the people who visited your school said, uh, make sure the children don't lose their wisdom. Um, <laughs> that really resonated with me because I'm on this journey because of my daughter. Um, so I I'd, I'd like to know like have you like how do you take that on board um at your school? Thanks Namali. <laughs> oh that's nice that she's there with you. That's great. <laughs> um so I think so first of all I've got to say that I I feel myself as an instrument, not as any guide in my school or not any mom or leader or principal. I feel like um, I'm observing and I am learning on this journey. And although many of the, the interactions we have are very intuitive, I believe having the freedom to know what you need instead of being posed as a school, it's very important. For example, I know when I'm thirsty. I know when I need to go to the toilet. I know when I'm very tired and I cannot focus. And I know how to take care of myself in those moments and say, you know what? I cannot focus in this class right now. And I know if I go for a five-minute walk, I'll come back much more refreshed. So our students know they have this intrinsic knowledge. And from... from uh, native uh, cultures, the knowledge is that kids are born knowledgeable. They observe, they learn, they adapt, and they take responsibility for this adaptation. They know if they're able to climb half tree, full tree, or if they can jump from the tree and they know what's going to happen. What the, the shaman especially says is, don't let them get too comfortable. He says, in these cultures, the more comfort you add to a child's life, less chances a child will have to learn and keep their cycle on their own. So let them show you the path. What a good answer. Let them show you the path. 
Reminds me too that tomorrow I'll be hosting a fairly open space for conversation around intergenerational education and really intergenerational wisdom transfer um, moving in all of the directions. So um, I hope some of you will pop in there to so we can spend more time together. Other questions? Actually, can I just quickly speak into that as well while people yeah, are thinking? Please. So one of my favorite moments I remember watching in one of my workshops is um, is an 80-year-old retired professor being taught about ecology by a 16-year-old girl. It was so magical. And to see how he was receiving the information, this university professor, you know, um, to see how he was receiving this information from this 16 year old was really, really beautiful. It was such a beautiful thing to witness. And I think we all know, you know, children are some of our, our greatest teachers, you know, because they're unencumbered by um, life's, you know, all, all the nonsense that the, the world tries to put on us and you know, convince us is, is real. They just see things the way they are and they just say it the way they see it. And um, and I think this also is probably one of the most significant things that I uh, try to achieve on my workshops is, is to uneducate people and to get people to see and express what they see. So quite often I'll, I don't know, take like a a branch or something from a tree and just get to people to say right what do you see and then they start oh that's Eliak no 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 I don't want to know the name of the plant that's that's a, a name that someone has given to it what do you see you know and then they start describing it and the more and more they start to go into detail the more they begin to understand the plant and uh, understand why it's it is that way what was its survival strategy as to why it has a leaf of that shape why it has a bark why it has this and so yes yeah, so really deconstructing and allowing you know and and children have this so a big part of the work that we were doing with the children in permaculture is it's all about child-led education so how is it that you create a spark of imagination quite often you don't need to they will do it themselves uh, but sometimes you might plant, you know, I don't know, bring a, a box of slugs or something into the into the classroom and, and all the reaction that comes from that. And then you allow their own imagination to explore. Well, why are they here? Should they be here? Where should they be? What do they where where can we put them where they'll be more happy and and all the rest and then allow them to just go off on their their tangents and work things out for themselves. And the only responsibility for the, those who are facilitating the education is to help them harvest and understand what they've learned at the end of it. And so really this child-centered learning is, is really essential because they have it, they know it already. There's, you know, um, we just need to not get in the way. I think it was Einstein who said, all children are born geniuses, then they go to school. <laughs> Yes, I believe you're correct about that quote and its attribution. Uh, this reminds me, as we're wrapping up, of one of the provocations, uh, queries, and entry points that the organizing committee put forward. Is it time to compost the word education? And I've really been sitting with that a lot. Um, because as we've just explored, like so much wisdom is innate, and it may be that many of us who were meticulously prepared for a future that is no longer promised and was always sort of premised on a whole lot of falsehoods, um, which is a kind way to say it. Um, we're the ones that need to do a lot of the unlearning and deprogramming and to open ourselves to the wisdom that is everywhere. And I certainly see that in what all of our speakers, our butterflies here today were, are doing. And I'm grateful for that in the world. Thank <music> you.